Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Constant Writers. I'm your host Dave Wilson and this is the show where I talk to indie horror authors about them, their work and their relationship, of course, with Stephen King. And this episode is another great one. I'm talking to Thomas Bloom, one of the most recognisable faces and voices in the scene of indie horror. So in this episode, I talk to Thomas about his love of writing, his own work and some of the incredible audio work he does. He's increasingly the go-to voice for audiobooks and he has his own excellent podcast as well. Be sure to check out the description for links to all of Thomas's things and some of my things as well, like my newsletter and my quiz book. And then, of course, stick around for the rest of the conversation because when Thomas and I pivot to King, well, that's when it gets even more interesting. We talk about his relationship with King and then we spend a bit of time going into his choice of book, Pet Cemetery. Oh yeah, we're going big. So go and explore the episode. If you enjoy it, share it with a friend. Do leave ratings, reviews, all of those kind of things. And check out Thomas's work. He's fantastic. And I'll be back with you at the end just to say bye. Thomas, welcome to Constant Writers. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. I appreciate the invite and I am super excited just to nerd out about Stephen King. Yeah, well, we will we will get to the Stephen King stuff um, eventually, but we do have a lot to talk about on your side of things as well, and that's one of the reasons I set this thing up was to to learn more about some of the amazing indie horror authors out there. So, I mean, you've got so much going on. You've obviously got your writing, but your podcasts. You're an audiobook narrator now, um, so plenty for us to dig into. I guess let's go back to the start. Like, tell me a bit about how you got in. To writing and reading like what, what's your origin story and all of this kind of stuff yeah so i started reading at a really young age and it 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 went from my mom reading to me to me wanting to read to my mom very quickly mm-hmm. and she picked up on that and i'm super grateful and thankful that she didn't try to hinder it and so she just was constantly giving me books, buying me new books, let me read out loud, helping me work through words. And, you know, so by the time I got to kindergarten, by the time I walked into school, I was miles ahead. A lot of the other kids that, you know, maybe didn't get that at home. And so, you know, in terms of reading, it's been a passion, a love since I was just a, a little guy. And then in terms of writing, really, I think that that started in third grade when I found Goosebumps books. Mm -hmm. And so I was constantly wanting to write my own little Goosebumps books. But as happens a lot with writers when they're starting off, I had really bad shiny object syndrome. So I'd write a little bit in one story and then I'd jump to another and so on and so forth and never actually finished anything. But then in terms of actually getting some momentum, I was in, I was in college. It was, I think it was like 2014 and I had just randomly, I had this idea for a story. And at the time I was listening to a lot of Stephen King's works on, on, uh, audio. And so my mind was just full of ideas and characters and plots and settings and all sorts of really fun and interesting stuff. A lot of, you know, first time reads for me, uh, during that time in in terms of King. And so I had a, uh, an idea for a story. I remember it clearly. I was out on a walk And I just had this vision of a guy who was sort of struggling with, with his mental health. And he had started obsessing about a window in his cabin and it just sort of went from there. And so at that point I started just writing early concept of my debut novel, the window. Continued to add to that. It was sort of one of those things where I'd pick it up. I'd maybe write a few paragraphs, forget about it for a few weeks, come back to it. It wasn't like a you know, a fever pitch or anything <laughs> like that. It was just a cool idea that I had. And I, I every once in a while, I'd get bored and be like, I should write. Um, but then really, it was 2019 uh, when I 
buckled down and was like, I'm going to finish this. And so I did. I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I finished my first manuscript of that. And then that's what led me during, in between the first manuscript and the second one, I, in a fever pitch, wrote out Disciples of Nergal during the lockdown. So early to mid 2020. And that was the first thing that I published, but then not long after that, I released my debut novel. Disciples of Nergal is a novella, and I give that away uh, to my newsletter subscribers. And Mm -hmm. now I've created like an audio drama version that's on YouTube, and it's available as a podcast as well. But yeah, that's really how it started. And since then, for me, completing something opened a a door in my mind and it was just like you can complete stuff you can you know do something then move on to the next thing finish it then move on <laughs> and so i've seen a lot of success in terms of just being able to finish product uh projects put them out there and yeah that's the the long and short of it yeah great and we'll, we'll i'll make sure i put all the links to all of those things you mentioned in the description for this as well and I guess another thing that you you finished and you've come back to is your your stories with horror and heart series, which I think a few people may have have seen. It certainly, I think that's where I first came across your name. Um, it's an interesting combination, horror and heart, and I think it's one that's quite pertinent to the fact that we're we're sort of joining together today to talk about Stephen King. But I was curious, what what is it about that combination that appeals to you? Is it is it from the King side of things, or is there is there something else at work there? Yeah, I think that King definitely gave me some inspiration on that. I I think that he does a good job of that, having scares, but also having some tender moments. And for me, whether I'm writing, whether I'm reading, whether I'm watching a movie, and if it's a horror genre or horror adjacent, if I don't care about the characters, I don't care about the fact that they're being chased by a killer, that they have an alien growing inside of them, that they're scared of the dark or the woods or whatever. It just, it to me, the stakes aren't high enough. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. I, I am an empath to the nth degree, and I've always been that way. And I, I'm just, uh, I'm very passionate in terms of just people, and I care. And you know, it's it's a blessing and a curse, obviously. I've had a lot of people take advantage of that. Obviously, that opens me up for uh, a lot of heartbreak and 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 sadness and and whatnot. But I just I can't help it. I can't help it. It's not something where it's like, oh, I've learned from that mistake. Now I'm just going to change my inner being. <laughs> um, so it, emotion and 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 heart and love and tenderness. I just, I, I, I really vibe with it. And then on the flip side, you know, they might seem very opposite in terms of horror and, and fear and, and being scared, but I've also really always vibed with that. And so mixing the two just came naturally to me. And I really appreciate what Mike Flanagan has been able to do over the past few years, specifically with his Netflix miniseries mm-hmm. with The Haunting of Hill House, Haunting of Bly Manor, uh, Midnight Mass. I'm about, uh, currently halfway through uh, The Midnight Club, but he does a tremendous job of mixing horror and heart. And so even though I was leaning in that direction and liking and loving those things before I even knew who Mike Flanagan was. He really has inspired me to continue on and has given me insight into new and fresh ways to do that. But also, I've always in the back of my mind wondered if putting too much heart, too many tender moments in would turn off horror audiences and he has shown me that that is not the case and so yeah it's just full full steam ahead and i do continue to uh, i i plan to release more volumes within the stories with horror and heart series i i envision in my mind at least nine volumes and i would like to 
combine volumes one through nine into like an omnibus mm -hmm. and put that out in paperback and maybe even like a hardback edition. That's, you know, years down the road, yeah. but it's just sort of a, a, a goal that I have. But yeah, so far, like you said, that that's how you heard, heard about me first. And a lot of people, that's where they've come to my writing. It's it's through that series because yeah. they're short. You know, it, every volume is just four short stories, and I, I think it's a good entry point and to show what what I'm about. When you read my novels, my longer works, you'll you'll still get a lot of that horror in heart, but just not in a bite sized morsel. Well, I was I was going to ask you kind of if you had an elevator pitch for your style what it would be because I've, I've read the window as well and really enjoyed that one and i've got the uh the potted plant is downloaded and, and ready to go as well like it, it, is it is that your your hook almost that you 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 will scare people that you but you will also make them feel feel things as well yeah for sure you know that's that's my sort of flagship series if you will but it's also my calling card and you know when you get onto my website or, you know, you get on Goodreads or Amazon, you look at my author blurb, you know, I, I, I tend to mention that, that that is my aim. That is my goal to write stories with horror and heart. I want you to care about these characters <laughs> before maybe I break your heart. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, I, again, it's just a part of who I am and I can't help it. Even when I'm trying to, uh, and I have, I've tried to like, let's lean more. So like, let's just get to the point with the horror and leave the heart out of it. I, I tried to do that with the potted plant, but the heart just came back in. It is, it's a revenge tale, but the heart is still there. And it's one of those things where the, the protagonist, the narrator of that, it's written in first person, you know, he, he's, he's not a good guy. He's really not a good guy, but because I I give such a, a peek into his mind and his inner workings, you can't help but sort of feel sorry for the guy. And even though you disagree with the the decisions that he's making, you can sort of say, I I can at least disagreeing. I can understand how he came to that. Hmm. And and I, I, my goal is to get people to think too, to do a little introspection when you read my stuff. Yeah. And like and I guess the heart side of things doesn't necessarily have to mean hugs and kisses every time right it's it's the human side of it as much as anything so even if you have got a nasty character if, if you're trying to get people to to get into their head a bit then it's, it's a good way of going about it um another thing i was going to ask i mean i know i i obviously as i mentioned sort of discovered your name first with with your own work your horror and heart series but any other fans of, of indie horror stuff might well have seen your name crop up in in various anthologies over the last couple of years and that's kind of a it's a key part of the the indie horror community. How are you how are you finding putting your work out there um, to those publications alongside sort of putting your own stuff out there? This this whole approach to to indie publishing is quite a it can be quite a misty and daunting world in many ways. Like you, you've been at it for a couple of years now and and doing it pretty well. Like how how are you finding it? Yeah, a great question, and it's one that I ask myself a lot. <laughs> And honestly, just full disclosure, in the year of 2022, my goal was to submit more stories, mm -hmm. but that just didn't happen. Both of, of the anthologies that I was publishing in 2022, they were invitations. <laughs> and it, I don't know. It's one of those things where there were a few anthologies that I really wanted to submit to. And then I started writing the story and it grew there. There was a call for novellas and I was like, all right, this would be great. I can get this published. I can get my name out there. But as I started working on it, it turned into the longest thing that I've ever written. And it's not not published yet. But y'all, y'all should hopefully be be seeing that sooner rather than later. But yeah, I, I don't know. I I try not to box myself in too much, and I I tend to get overwhelmed with things or bored with things, and that's another reason why you know you've mentioned the audiobooks, the podcasts, the writing. I do a lot of different things so that I can bounce back and forth. 
Um, but yeah, it, being in anthologies with other authors is integral to not just indie horror, but I think the the horror genre in general. And it's been like that for years and years and years. Um, I, I don't know if everybody even understands that with Stephen King's publications like Night Shift and Nightmares and Dreamscapes, Everything's Eventual, and all these short story collections, those were published elsewhere beforehand. And then he collected them and put them out as a, a single author collection. But it, it's it's important and I want to do better going forward. <laughs> I'm not going to make any promises because there is also the fact of when it comes to an anthology, sometimes I'll, I'll maybe write a story and if I'm very proud of it, I, I don't want there to be a potential that it gets lost in the shuffle with with, with other other voices. And so when I'm thinking about writing for an anthology, I am mindful of what is the focus here? What is the theme? How broad is it? Um, if it's more broad, I feel better about it. But if it's if it's focused a little too much, uh, I, I grow trepidatious because I have. I've read anthologies where, you know, five of the stories seem very similar and they don't stand out as much. And so there's there's a little give and take in my mind when it comes to that. And also when it comes to my single author collections with stories with horror and heart, I don't want to just sort of throw the leftovers into that. I yeah. want to put my best foot forward. Um, so it's a constant juggling act. I, I wish I was a little more clear in my mind, the direction that I want to go. And sometimes it changes based on the story. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers the question you're asking or not. No, it does. It does. And it's always interesting to hear. I think, you know, because some people are so, uh, what's the word, like just wedded to keeping it all in their own control and, and not fussed about the anthologies. Other people are like anthologies only and sort of almost want that, always need that validation of somebody else approving their story and have to publish them. And I feel like you're one of the ones who've sort of dipped their toes in both and had success on both sides of it. And I think it's, yeah, I think I think it's uh, it's interesting. It's definitely interesting doing both sides, for sure. And I think there's there's so much talent out there. And you're right. I think, you know, the I think the point you've made there about whatever serves the story best. I think that that ultimately feels like a sensible way of going. And um, yeah, it, yeah, it definitely does answer the question in, in some way at least. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get on to talking King, I mean, you we we both mentioned your podcast and your audiobook stuff and I'm I'm keen to hear a little bit more about that so we've got your your excellent podcast into the gloom um tell me a bit about that one first so I give people the the pitch for what the the podcast is in case you haven't listened but but also where did that come from was podcasting something you wanted to do because it was obviously a thing that boomed over the last couple of years is it something you wanted to do for a while is it just you realize you've got a great voice and you wanted to do something with it like how, how did that all come about Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it really, you, you touched on a lot of things there. I've been listening to, like, I, I, I'm an OG podcast listener. I'm very proud of that fact. I've been listening to podcasts since 2008 when wow. nobody knew what a podcast was. And I, I've just always loved the, the medium. I've loved that format and just the concept of you know, a few people talking on a certain topic, a certain subject. And so I've, I've been listening to them and, and being fueled by them during workouts, during runs, during chores for years and years and years, over a decade. And so that, that seed has always been there, but the way that this came about, it was actually, it's really interesting because the audiobook thing and the podcast thing are tied very closely together. Mm. What happened is one of my spooky friends and in the indie horror community, Haley Newland, she was looking to find a narrator for her novel, Take Your Turn, Teddy. And she was struggling to find somebody who specifically was able to match the voice of the antagonist in that story, The Shadow. 
And we were talking about it in a group chat with other authors. And anyways, I just sort of kind of just goofing off. I sent her an audio recording uh, in, uh, via DM on Instagram and she loved it. And we just started talking and it, it grew from there. I did a little research on microphones and, and what all it would take. So that was my first audio book. And that also opened up the opportunity in my mind. It's like, I could pivot with this a little bit as well. And maybe I could interview some folks. And because her and I had been talking about podcast interviews, specifically with getting on podcasts, and I've been talking about it a little bit with Spencer Hamilton as well. And so I just did some brainstorming and some soul searching and was just like, I want to do this. And honestly, it was a little bit of a, there's a selfish motive behind it too because it gives me the excuse, the opportunity to talk with other authors and get their insight, their input, how their brains think, their tips and tricks when it comes to to writing. And so, yeah, I just launched off. The The podcast is, is called Into the Gloom. I, 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 I'm a big believer in branding. I hope people have picked up on that in terms of some of my catchphrases and reminding people people to to leave a light on and you know some some of the the colors that i use and the imagery i use. right right now you are a visual representation of your avatar yeah. so yeah it's great it's so on that is on <laughs> <laughs> and so i i wanted to have a little branding there and so I, I i wanted to figure out how to get gloom in there and into the gloom just sort of came about during a brainstorm and it seemed mm-hmm. to fit so i rolled with that i'm a little bit goofy and I'm unapologetic about that. So if you listen to the podcast and you've heard my intro, especially there's a, a little campiness there. And yeah, just it, it just sort of came from there. I, I was reaching out to people that I knew fairly well at first, uh, having them come on the show. But now I've started to reach out and, and make some some connections with with folks that maybe I don't know so well. I've had a few people on the podcast that I really didn't talk to them much until then. And it's still, I'm still passionate about it. I still love it. I still enjoy it. The feedback I've, I've gotten from listeners has been great. So the, the audiobook thing and the podcast thing are, are very much tied in together. I did sort of from early on, I was toying with the possible idea of in the future narrating my own books. <laughs> and Haley gave me the opportunity and sort of pushed me to, you know, try out narrating somebody else's book. And now at this point, you know, I, I've, I, I don't have them in front of me, but probably 15 to 20 audio books that I've done and only a couple of my own. I really need to do the window. I really need to do voodoo child. I'll get to them eventually. But it's really cool. It's been fun. Some of the books I've already read, I'd read beforehand. Some of them, as I'm narrating them, I'm reading them for the first time. And so it's it's been fun. It's been really interesting. And hopefully, you know, down the road, it will be a little more lucrative. Yeah. And I, I'm I'm looking in today's world, you have to be you have to really diversify. So I'm hoping that I can pull people into my brand and 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 highlight some of my my spooky friends as well through the podcast. But then again, with the audiobooks, that brings in some income and spotlights people's writings, and hopefully it'll all funnel them back into my own writing. Yeah, great stuff. Well, I think we've put him off long enough. So we did come together through a shared love of Stephen King. So let's get on to him. Let's do it. I guess to start off. What what does Stephen King? You've hinted already that he is he is someone you greatly admire. But this is a question I'm asking everyone on this series. Like, what does King mean to you? What sort of place does he have in your heart? And, and what sort of impact has he had on your writing as well? Yeah, he he holds a very large and special place in my heart, and is just a tremendous inspiration in so many ways just writing memorable characters, amazing stories, creating essentially at this point a genre of his own. 
and his name is his brand. His name is his genre. And I, I read my first King book when I was 14 and I, well, well, I'll, I'll share later what mm-hmm. that book was, but that, that was my, really my first dip into adult fiction. Mm-hmm. And it was a little rough. There was a lot of it that was just sort of over my head, but I did like it. There was, there was something there. And then a couple of years later in high school, I was gifted nightmares and dreamscapes uh, from my brother. And I found out in my high school library, there were a handful of King books. So, you know, I checked out the Tommy knockers. I checked out everything's eventual. I read nightmares and dreamscapes and I, I was just dumbfounded by this man's imagination. So yeah, he he's he's been a part of my life essentially since I was 14 and I've continued reading. I have read more books by King than any other single author. I've reread more King books than any other book or author. And he has definitely had had an impact on my writing itself. A number of people have left reviews or given me feedback and and said, you must really love Stephen King because you write like him. Your writing reminds me of him. And I take that as a a tremendous honor. You know, the, the fact that people would even see that and make that connection. So yeah, King's King's huge in in my my universe. Hmm. Yeah, mine as well. I mean, all of that is him. <laughs> um, so I've I've asked all of the guests on this series to to pick one King release in particular to talk about in a bit more depth. And um, you've gone for Pet Cemetery, which I'm very excited to get onto. But I know that most King readers have more than one favourite. So I always want to give people the chance to to sort of give some honourable mentions. And when we were arranging this, you picked out one short story in particular that kind of tied into your brand in particular wasn't there so what what was top of your honorable mentions list and then why why was it so close to being the one yeah there's a short story that is in the night shift collection from 1978 and it's entitled the last rung on the ladder i think that a lot of people breeze over it because a it is very short b it's not it's not very, it, you wouldn't read it and say, oh, this is a horror story. There are definitely, there's some scary stuff in there um, in terms of just humanity and the human condition. Mm-hmm. But it also, in that collection, it comes right after Children of the Corn. And I, I think that, you know, everybody knows about Children of the Corn, whether it's the movie adaption, adaptions or, or the story itself. But it, it seems to not get mentioned too much. And so when, when you gave me this opportunity, I was like, all right, this one. And, and yeah, it's not, it's not a horror story per se, but there's a ton of heart in it. And it's very sad. Uh, essentially, it's a, the, the narrator, this, this guy is, is talking about his sister that, he, he loves, but he's lost touch with over the years. They've sort of gone different directions in their life. And the majority of the story is him retelling a, a an instance that happened, an experience that they had together when they were just little kids. And it involves going into a barn and climbing up this this ladder and, and getting up into the, the high rises of this barn and her getting stuck and dangling from the last rung of this ladder and if she fell from that distance she would have been seriously injured maybe even killed so her brother's running back and forth making a mountain of 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 hay so that she would be able to land in something soft and it's just very it's very heartwarming and touching and it's just this this intimate yet complicated older brother younger sister relationship but then he goes on to share how things had had changed between them over the years. And I, I, I don't know, is is it okay for me to spoil the ending? 
Yeah, I th- I think so. I think okay, so. 1978, here's, right? Yeah, here's the spoiler <laughs> warning in case anyone hasn't read it. And essentially, the way that it ends, it's just a, a dagger in the heart of the mm-hmm. reader because he has received a suicide note from his sister, and she is essentially, I've, I've got it right here, um, the the last line of her letter i've been thinking about it a lot lately and what i've decided is that it would have been better for me if that last rung had broken before you had put the hay down so essentially she's saying i wish i would have died when we were we were kids i was so much happier then i i didn't go through all the heartache that i've gone through now um and she sent this letter to him and Obviously, in reading that, he realizes what is going on. This is a suicide note, and he would have come running. He would have done whatever was possible to change that. But sadly, because they had lost touch, become a little estranged, he had moved, and he hadn't told her about this address change, so he received the letter two weeks after she committed suicide. Mm -hmm. That's just how the story ends, and it's just like, and it's oh. one as well, that one appearing in Night Shift, like, you know, King often gets accused of just being a horror writer and he's got his his own famous story of the woman in the grocery store who was like, I don't like those horror stories, I like that Shawshank Redemption, he's like, I wrote that, no you didn't. But for him to have that one, and to a lesser extent, because it's probably a bit scary, but the woman in the room, both in Night Shift, that was what, third, fourth published book of his career? Like right there in the seventies, he's showing he's more than just a horror writer. I think it's yeah. I think it's fascinating. Yeah, and yeah, it's one of my favorites from that collection, absolutely. And it's it's I think the strength of that story in is is there in the fact that it can sit amongst all these classic horror shorts and still stand out as being a magnificent piece of work. And it kind of yeah, it is horrifying and it is gut wrenching, is it and it is heartbreaking. And in its own way, kind of beautiful as well, which I think I think is a really powerful thing for such a short story as well. Yeah, it's very short, and it and it it kind of segues into your choice of pet cemetery as well, because for, I mean, for me, completely terrifying and completely beautiful is is often how I describe this book. So I mean, just to just to get the housekeeping out of the way, King's third book from nineteen eighty three, coming after um, Christine and the Cycle of the Werewolf, and this is. It's one of his most famous pieces of work, obviously, but this is infamously the one that he was supposedly so scared of, he refused to publish it himself for for quite some time. So it's got that sort of lore and that legend behind it. And as I say, it's one I always, I always point to people as a sort of, if you want the most powerful portrait of grief ever captured in literature, read Pet Cemetery. But those are my thoughts on it. I mean, why why did you ultimately plump for Pet Cemetery as the one you wanted to to bring to the table here? Yeah, you you hit the nail on the head. I agree with everything that you said, and I often I tell people that that this this book is the the best thematically speaking, the best book that I have read looking at the topics of death and grief and how we deal with it within the human condition, how we think about it, how we talk about it, how we react to it. And it's just, yeah, it's it's powerful. It's powerful. And it's one of those books that every time I reread it, I'm actually currently rereading it for the fourth time. Mm-hmm. And my, my wife is reading it along with me we ever ever since the first month we got married we have our own little private book club so every month we read a book together and um so this is her first time reading <laughs> it's funny some of the texts that i get as as she's reading different parts of it and oh, i think one of the last ones we're about halfway through it but she said wow this book is just a little ray of sunshine isn't it <laughs> <laughs> um and it is it's it's very bleak. It's very sad, all depressing in a lot of ways. Yet, yet, there are so many beautiful moments and tender moments. Whether you're talking about Lewis and his daughter Ellie, whether you're talking about even between Lewis and, and his wife Rachel, whether you're talking about Lewis and Judd Crandall or Judd and his wife Norma. Um, and then every scene with Gage is just... Um, 
heartwarming until it's not. Um, and so I just, I, this book haunts me. I can't stop thinking about it. I can't let it go. And honestly, yeah, it, it scares me in a different way. It doesn't scare me of like, I'm, you know, I need to leave the lights on. It doesn't scare me in a way of I'm I'm worried about what's hiding behind the shower curtain in the way that some of King's other books are, but it taps into one of my greatest fears, especially when it comes to having children. My wife and I currently don't have kids, and we're still sort of debating and talking and, and wondering if, if, if we want to, but one of the biggest things that is holding me back is the thought, the fear of losing a child, because I know it would absolutely wreck me, destroy me. I know myself. And the way that King captures those emotions in this book, whether it's from Lewis, whether it's from Rachel, whether it's even from his, his in-laws, it is just spellbinding. It's astounding. <laughs> His, his comprehension, his understanding, and ability to write out the human condition is bar none. And this yeah. book, it has it all. It has it all. I mean, I've, I reread this book for the first time probably about five or six months after my first son was born. Mm. And yeah, I mean, the way it hits you, I mean, you, you're reading it for the fourth time and, and you already said it, so it's hitting you different each time, but if you do get to the point in your life where you have children and you pick this one up again, man, does it really hit different there. And like, I think for me, something that's always stuck in this book is, and they capture it brilliantly in the Mary Lambert adaptation, is where Gage's coffin gets knocked off the stand at the funeral home and you just see a glimpse of his little hand in the suit. And that that always stuck with me from from the very first time I read it as something, probably the most chilling detail in the book. But but then rereading it as a parent, and then a few pages later, where you get Lewis, who's so dug him up and embracing the dead body of his child. It's just like one of the few times I've actually had to put a book down and just like not think about anything for a moment because it really is, it's, it's, they say it's so powerful. And I think for me that the fact that the scariest parts are, are nothing to do with the reanimated corpses of anything coming back it is that human side of it which which really yeah. gets under my skin so you're on the fourth read of this like when did when did you first read this where were you in life when you first read this and how did it hit then compared to how it's hitting now so i first read it around the time that i was you know just starting to have these ideas for for writing again mm -hmm. so it, it would have been 2014 2015 somewhere in there and yeah at the time it was more of the spooky elements that drew me in but then with each successive read it was more of like i said the the human condition stuff that that really has kept me coming back and there's my wife and i we were we were walking through the woods yesterday and we, it was like a you know a, a nature park sort of thing and we stopped at this bench and we sat there and we were just talking just talking about life talking about philosophy talking about existential dread <laughs> and um something that we were talking about it brought up the book and like i said we're both reading it together so which, which is cool it, the, yeah. I, I encourage that for for any couple out there if 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 you're struggling to find in depth conversation to have with your spouse, start a book club together. Mm. Um, but yeah, we we were just talking about how much philosophy and theology there is in this book from so many different viewpoints. You know, you get stuff coming from Judd, you get stuff coming from Rachel, you get stuff coming from Lewis, and then you even get a lot of really tremendous thought-provoking one-liners from Ellie, this little girl, and mm -hmm. oftentimes in life, you know, the, the stuff that children say, they just view things so differently, and it just, it can knock you for a loop. And 
And so, yeah, when it when it just comes to, like I said, philosophy, theology, thinking about, you know, death and and what is after and and all of that, this book just it, it brings that to the forefront and it doesn't it it's not a treatise on it where it's like me as the author, Stephen King, I'm trying to convince you of my way of viewing things. It's very open ended. And I appreciate that. And it brings all these different perspectives from different um, ages and, and even cultures and, and mindsets and just leaves it all on the page. And it's just like, just just wrestle with that. Just deal with that. And it it's really cool when when a book tries to get you to accept whatever mindset or understanding the author has. I think that those books serve a, a purpose and they have a place, but I think that their readability is lacking. And with this one, because it doesn't offer a lot of answers, um, uh, it, the, the readability is is there. And at least for me, it will continue to be there. Yeah, yeah. And even even like just thinking about it now as you were talking then, like even thinking about all of the the trauma that the different characters have gone through in their lives and the way that is processed into the story. Like, again, it's, the, it's, it's this book that the majority of people who are aware of it know of it because of the the dead things coming back to life and yet that's kind of bottom of my list in terms of what i think about when when i yeah. see this book on the shelf it's it's fascinating that it can have so much power so you you pick this one then let's let's have let, i don't know let's have some some quick fire um highlights for you then like who who's your who's your favorite character in this what's your favorite scene scariest scene what 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 are your what are your uh, your key plays from this one Honestly, it changes with each time I read it. This time I'm I'm about halfway through it. And it I think my favorite character with this read is is Lewis. Mm. I'm I'm really just I'm vibing with him, man. I I, I I get his mindset and his way of thinking and his struggle. I think the last time I read it, I, I would have said Judd. I, I just love his sort of old school wisdom, his way of of saying things, and his own the the his own wrestling match that he's having in his mind, in his soul, in terms of giving Lewis this information about the pet cemetery of of, of, of or what's beyond the pet cemetery and and what it does. So yeah, I think this time it's Lewis in terms of the scenes, the. The graveyard scene where Lewis goes and digs up Gage, that will always stick with me for so many reasons. It's just, it's so vivid. It's so real with him parking on the street, having to figure out how to get over the gate, getting the tools over there, you know, cars driving by, got to stay hidden. Um, and then, yes, finally unearthing his his dead son. All of that really stands out. The What really puts this story in motion, though, is... Victor Pascal, his death, but then also the his his return in in this dream that isn't a dream, and that one always sticks out. It, it's 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 creepy, and it it brings the supernatural front and center pretty early in the story. It lets you know yeah. that this is what to expect going on. But besides just scenes themselves. The foreshadowing that King has put into this book, and that's where I think, in terms of re-readability, it, it's 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 amazing because early on, I didn't realize that just so early on in this book, some of the foreshadowing that takes place, and and just the the instances of of the road and the the reiteration of the road and the Orinco trucks and and all of that and even with ellie you know wondering about her cat and how is he going to die when's he going to die god can't have my cat he can take any other cat like there's so much foreshadowing and that that's good that is good and i i i've been inspired in this reading to do more of that in my own writing as i go through in second maybe third manuscripts you know sprinkle some of that foreshadowing yeah. in. god can't have my cat famously line which 
King's own daughter Naomi shouted when when their when their cat got uh, smooshed on the uh, on the road. So um, like you, they said earlier, the kid sometimes the kids can come out with the best lines. Yeah. Um, we've got we've got to touch on the the adaptations. I, I, we don't need to spend too long on them, but obviously there have been, uh, I mean, two adaptations of the book and a, and a, and a bonkers sort of one in between as well. So we've got the 1989 Mary Lambert directed original, which is based on a King screenplay and filmed in May in may in maine um we've got the 2019 remake which was bold for want of a for want of a uh, another word and we have pet cemetery 2 which was mary lambert doing a crazy sequel um you're a fan of you're a fan of these yeah so the the eight the 89 film mary lambert's adaption is phenomenal i love it i love it i love it i love it 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 makes me cry every time I watch it. Um, the you know the the kite scene with Gage and the truck, always cry, always cry. The the bloody shoe flying in the air. Oh yeah, um, and yeah, it's just it's it's so well done. It's so well done, and it's it's very much it's true to the source material. I haven't seen Pet Cemetery two. I, I just I I've never gotten around to watching it, so I really don't have much to say on that. The 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 new one, the remake, if you can even call it that, you know, it's it's not the worst movie I've ever seen, but uh, to me, I don't think it holds a candle to the original, and I I think that. I could understand what the writers and what the director was trying to do. They were really trying to subvert expectations and and change some things. And some of the larger changes that they made just didn't hit for me personally. And then I, I think the biggest thing is, you know, John Lithgow, amazing actor um, and, and, and just tremendous in his own right. But Fred Gwynn, is Judd Crandall to me that that it, it it would be like trying to remake The Shining and not having Jack Nicholson in there it, it's you can do it and it might be fantastic but you're always going to be thinking back to Jack Nicholson and so that's kind of how I felt when it came to Judd and and the remake so yeah, you know, uh, maybe a six out of ten. I, I think I, I gave the remake, but the original is an eight point five, maybe even a nine out of ten yeah. for me. Just tremendous. Yeah. I think I'm with you. I think I'm with you. And for what it's worth, Pet Cemetery Two is is fun. It is a lot of fun, um, but it's very different tonally and plot wise and everything. But it's it's worth. It's a good. It's a good one for just sitting down with some popcorn and having fun. Um. I'm conscious of uh, I'm conscious of your time. We got we we we're going to sort of start gearing towards wrapping this up. But I guess last question on Pet Cemetery. And this is again is something I'm asking everyone um, for their choices. If somebody has listened to this who hasn't read Pet Cemetery and is wondering whether they should give it a go, what would your three word summary be to convince them to go and pick that book up and give it a read? Yeah, that's hard. I I think that. I would just go with sort of the trajectory of the story itself. And it it takes place a number of times, but it would just be death, grief, re- resurrection. Cool. Yeah, that does it. Great. Well, Thomas, we are almost done. Um, but before I let you go, I'm not even going to give you the option of doing this. I'm just warning you, this is what we've got to do before we finish. This is how it works. <laughs> We've got to get through the quick fire nineteen question king challenge. So, um, so I guess are you ready? Because we're going to do it. I'm ready. Okay, good. So this is the way we end this the, these little interviews. Nineteen quick fire questions. I think there's fourteen that are. I'll ask you a question. You give me an answer, and then the last five are either or. Um, you don't need to give me any explanation at all. If there's something in particular that really shocks me, I probably will press you for it. But um, otherwise, we'll just keep it rapid fire. So, uh, first King book you ever read? Yeah, that was Cujo at 14. Founded at a thrift store. The, my first one was Cujo as well. 
Let me go. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was good. I enjoyed it as a first one, obviously. Anyway, I'm rambling. Um, what's the most, well, I know the answer to this. What's the most recent King book you've read? You, you're literally halfway through it. We just talked about it. Yeah, Bad Cemetery. <laughs> uh, before that, it was, I listened to the audiobook version of Fairy Tale. Okay. Okay. How did you find it in a word? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the str- One of the strongest openings. The mm. first third of that book was fantastic. And from there, it was, it, at least for me, it was just sort of downhill. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, the the first third of that is is worth the price of admission. Fantastic, yeah, so much heart. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, what's your all time favorite King? Yeah, Pet Cemetery. Uh, that, it's that's my all time favorite novel. Okay, Fair in enough. general. Um, your all time least favorite King. <laughs> <laughs> Probably be okay. Okay, what do you think's King's most underrated book? So that one's hard. I, uh, I pick two. I'm I'm also a rambler too, so you can blame me for some some of this. <laughs> not just you know, a straight answer, uh, but the the two that I would say would be thinner. I really like thinner, and the end of that book with the end of that book is amazing. I just mm-hmm. I I love it. It it reminds me of the end of Pet Cemetery, it, and um. Yeah, so I I just I feel like that one gets a lot of hate. People don't really care for it, seem to like it very much. So that's why I would say it's underrated. But in terms of a book that I love and I feel is fantastic, but it just doesn't seem to get talked about very much, I would have to say Gerald's Game. Okay, yeah, yeah, and a good Mike Flanagan adaptation to bring it back to what you were saying earlier as well. Oh, oh yeah, and that adaptation is awesome. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Um, which King book has your favorite cover art? So I, that was tough cause I like a lot of them, but I think that uh, obviously too with King, he has so many cover variations, mm-hmm. but this specific one of night shift is really cool with the eyes, mm-hmm. uh, referring to the story in here. I am the doorway. I think that's yep. what it's called. But then yep. when you open it, you yeah. see you you realize that yes this is the you know essentially a cover for i am the doorway which is a a, a cool little horror sci-fi story yeah definitely i have that same edition yeah it's a, it's a great one um what's your least favorite cover art from a view okay <laughs> okay um so this is always one I'm, I'm fascinated to hear which if you could make this happen which king character would you most like to have a cameo in your own work yeah, I think it'd be Judd Crandall, and okay. I, I kind of did it a little bit in Voodoo Child. Uh, Mama Kaplata is is very much a a Judd Crandall like character. Okay, um, which King book or story would you say is most similar to your own style of writing? Probably Pest Cemetery. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the theme here. Yeah, okay, and the the last of. Before we get to the either or questions, um, last one for this little section. So I want you to give me one book for each of these categories. So one King book that you keep forever, you read only once, and you delete from existence. I can guess the last one, but we'll see. <laughs> no, I threw a curveball on that one. Oh. Okay, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I tried to. I tried to be a little different with this one. Mention mm-hmm. books I haven't mentioned yet. So to keep eleven twenty two sixty three. Mm-hmm. That book is just phenomenal, so well written, and and I'm I'm a sucker for historical fiction as well. So yeah, I would I would keep eleven twenty two sixty three. Um, reading once, I would say Firestarter mm-hmm. because it it's one of his earlier books. It's not the best book, not the best written book per se. It doesn't have the 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 deepest characters or anything, but it's really fun. And I think that there's there's something special about the first read mm. of that book in particular. Yeah. And then delete from existence. This one is going to anger uh, Dark Tower fans. I full disclosure: I've only read the first four books in the Dark Tower series. Mm-hmm. So when I read Insomnia, I was just like, "What the hell was that? What?" 
what is this? I, I, it just, it just didn't hit, it, it didn't hit for me and I didn't care for it. I, 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 I was, I was a little bit angry um, at the end, but I know that there are a ton of dark tower references and it's sort of integral to that whole universe, but I'm, I'm going to delete insomnia. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Do let us know what you think in the comments if, uh, if you're an insomnia <laughs> fan or a dark tower head. Um, so final five of this rapid fire round and then uh, then we'll wrap this up. And this is just a straight either or. So you definitely don't need to give me any explanation here unless you particularly want to. But um, the first one's pretty, pretty simple. The book or the movie? The book. Mm -hmm. The stand or it? It. So this is where it gets a bit interesting. Um, a holiday in Derry or a night at the Overlook? A holiday in Derry. Oh, bold, bold. Um, <laughs> you more of a fan of his short stories or full novels? That one is really hard. Mm -hmm. I love his short stories, but if I had to choose, if it was get rid of all his novels or get rid of all his short stories, uh, I'm I'm keeping the novels. Okay, okay. And the final question of the 19 question challenge, would you rather go for walkies with Cujo or have a nice weekend away with Annie Wilkes. I mean, Annie Wilkes is a trip, man. <laughs> like that would be a weekend to remember if if you I survive it. Survived it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean as 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 wild and crazy as she was, there there were ways to reason with her, but a rabid dog cannot be reasoned with. So I, I'm I'm going to I'm going to take my chances with with Miss Miss Wilkes. Okay, good. Well, good. Good luck on that. Straight on from a holiday in Derry as well. You're certainly, um, you're certainly not shy. Good, well, <laughs> Thomas. Thank you so much for coming on and, and geeking out with me about all of these things. It's been great to have you on. Um, before we wrap up, obviously we'll put links to all of your stuff in the comments and things. But please, this this is where I just want to wrap up with you plugging everything you want to plug. So where can people find you? Where can they find your work? Where can they? access your podcast all of those kind of things go 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 plug or everything you do yeah the podcast into the gloom it's available uh pretty much anywhere where you can get podcasts um and then i'm on tiktok you you get a little bit, bit more of my goofy side on tiktok so if you're into that thing instagram is probably the easiest place to connect with me and chat with me and i'm i'm, I'm pretty active there you can find my link tree in in my bio on instagram where everything else is but if you don't want to go that route and you want to go to each site just go to audible search thomas gloom and you can go down to amazon search thomas gloom and where everything is brought together all the links to all of my places and and info and the sign up for my newsletter just go to www.thomasgloom.com there we go Perfect. Get over there and get signed up and get reading. Thomas, again, thank you so much. It's been a terrific chat. And um, yeah, take care. I look forward to seeing more of your work soon. All right. I'll keep working. Thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity to nerd out about some Stephen King. So there we go. Huge thanks to Thomas for joining me. Do go and check out his stuff. His fiction is fantastic. His audio work is excellent, as you've heard. He's got a terrific voice, so it's no surprise he's doing well there. And follow the link in the description to just find all things Thomas Gloom and go and support him. Also in the description, you'll find links to my newsletter where you can get indie horror author recommendations and short stories from me. And you get my mini collection of short stories for free just for signing up. You'll also find links to pick up my Stephen King quiz book and some other stuff as well. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching and do join me again for another constant writer very soon.